Father, we love Your Word. We thank You that You've delivered it to us. You've preserved it for us. Thank You that by Your Holy Spirit we can understand Your truth, God, eternal, infinite truth. And I pray that by Your Spirit this morning, God, that You would open our eyes and that we would behold wondrous things, marvelous things from Your Word. I thank You for the time of praise and worship that we have shared in thus far, and may this just be a continuation of that, God. May You be honored and glorified. May Your name be great. May You have pleasure in us being here to study Your Word and to seek You, God, and to want to learn about You and how we can live lives that are pleasing to You. And so I pray, Father, for every heart in this room, God, every mind. We all need a touch from You and we need to hear from You, God. There are many different needs and issues present in this room today and You can speak to all of them. And so we trust and believe that that's exactly what you're going to do. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, well, I titled this message Spiritual Adoption. And the reason is, is because thus far, from chapters 1 through 7, it talks a great deal about salvation, that uh, we were all guilty, we were under God's wrath, we were in big trouble, but we were justified through faith in Jesus Christ. That is to say that we were made innocent, declared righteous, period. All because of what Jesus Christ did. And that, as glorious as it is, um, in a sense, that's just a judicial pardoning. We've been pardoned. We've been forgiven. And God could have just left it there, but He didn't. He went much farther. He actually invited us in to be sons and daughters of God, to be children of God. And I can't think of a better story to really illustrate this than that of the prodigal son in Luke 15. I think most of us are probably familiar with that, but there was two brothers, one in particular, wanted to leave. He wanted to leave the home. He wanted his inheritance now, and that's what happened. And the father gave him his portion of the inheritance, and he left. And he wasted it on prodigal living, as it says, and then his, his uh, life got really hard. Conditions were very difficult for him, and he thought, man, I'm just going to go home, beg forgiveness, and maybe Dad will let me be a hired servant. My life would be way better even as a hired servant than it is now. And so he set back home to do that very thing. And as he was going, his father saw him from a long distance, which tells us that he was watching and waiting and, and hoping that his son would return. And then he, he ran to the son, which is a really beautiful picture. And it's significant in that day and age, uh, elders, it was a very undignified thing to run like that. But he abandoned all of that and he went after his son in desperation. He embraced him and his son kind of put out there his, his little uh, deal. He just you know, sinned against his father, wanted to be a servant, but the father did so much more than that. He restored him completely. We're told that they put a robe on and put sandals on his feet, a ring on his finger, and then they took the, the fatted calf, this, uh, this feast that they put on to celebrate the fact that the son had come home. And the father says, this son of mine who was lost has been found, who was dead is now alive. And so in the same way, God has done that. He didn't just forgive us. He didn't just pardon our sins. He invited us into his family. He has adopted us, as it were, and we have become children of God. And the reality of this is um, it happens by the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And that's one of the major changes in this uh, point in the book. Up to this point, chapters 1 through 7, you see the Holy Spirit mentioned maybe two times. And now in this chapter, we're going to see the Holy Spirit mentioned 20 times. And so it's a real shift. And so we've been adopted into the family of God. We have been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And what we're going to see in this chapter are so many different spiritual blessings that are ours through the indwelling Holy Spirit. And I really wanted to do this whole chapter. I really did. Um, and I decided not to. Um, just because there is so much in here. So I went, I usually have about four pages of notes, and I thought, well, I'm just going to go through and prepare to do the whole thing, and it was eight pages of notes. So I thought, I'll spare you guys today. And so what we're going to see is we have freedom in the Spirit, we have life in the Spirit, and we have sonship in the Spirit. That's just a fancy way of saying that we have been made sons and daughters of God in the Spirit. And then lastly, we have hope in 
uh, hope and weakness. Hope and weakness. Um, so let's go ahead and get into it. Verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So therefore here, it says, there is therefore now no condemnation. I would say in part, connects all the way back to chapter 5, verse 1, where it says, therefore, having been justified, we have peace with God. Remember that? I talked about the fact that we have peace with God. We are no longer enemies of God, but we have the peace of God ruling in our hearts. The fact that He provides for us, He protects us, He leads us, He guides us. And so we have the peace of God and we have peace with God, peace in God. But I think this also more directly connects back to chapter 7, verses 24 and 25. You remember? He's talking about this condition where... I desire to do that which is right, that which is good, but there's something else happening in me that is fighting that at every point. There's this battle within us over doing right and doing wrong, and we desire to do that which pleases God, but we so often fall into that which is not pleasing to God. And then Paul cries out, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then he celebrates the fact that victory would come through Jesus Christ, his Lord. And so that's 7, 24, and 25. So, in light of that, we have peace with God. We have deliverance through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now there is no condemnation. No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Literally, no guilty verdict. There is no guilt. There is no shame. There is no penalty. Guys, this has been one of my favorite verses throughout my, my Christian walk. I mean, if you just stop and think about that, let that soak in for a second. No condemnation, period, because it has been paid for at the cross. Our guilty verdict is gone. Do you ever feel condemnation? Do you ever feel guilt? Do you ever feel shame? Well, it's not from the Lord. It's not from the Lord. It's important that you understand that. Why? Because there is no condemnation if you are in Christ Jesus. Christ was condemned on our behalf. And so conviction is something that we as believers ought to experience. When we sin or fall into sin, it should grieve us and we should be convicted. And that is God by His Holy Spirit drawing us to Him. We should be grieved over our sin, and we should come back to God and confess and repent and turn from our sin. Condemnation is a tool of the enemy to drive you away from God. When you feel guilt, when you feel shame, when you feel like you have to hide from the Lord, remember Adam and Eve, what did they do? They went and hid. They tried to cover themselves, and then they tried to hide from the presence of the Lord. That's what condemnation is, guilt and shame. That's what that does. There is none of that in Christ Jesus. If you have put your trust in Him, and you've been forgiven of your sins, washed, born again, there is no condemnation. Isn't that glorious news? For those who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You may notice in the ESV or the NASB that you don't find that little phrase there. Um, it's been said that the earlier manuscripts don't have that. For those who, uh, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You find that again in verse 4. And so some think that that was a scribal error that he put it in there twice. And the reason I bring that up is because here's the deal. It's just point blank. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's nothing attached to that. Period. Point blank. Amen? And then verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So the reality of the indwelling Holy Spirit has made me free from the reality of sin and death. I mean, sure, there is sin that we struggle with. We talked about that at great length. But we've been set free from the bondage and the life-dominating sin that controlled us. Now we are filled by the Spirit, led by the Spirit, and we are no longer under condemnation. We no longer have to account for sin. It's been washed away, accounted for at the cross. So verse 3 for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. 
on account of sin, He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. There's that phrase again. So simply put, the law cannot save us because of the weakness of our flesh. The law is good. Remember, we talked about that last week. But in our flesh, we are weak. The Spirit is willing, but the flesh is what? Weak. So we can't keep the law. So what we could not do for ourselves, God did for us by sending His Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and condemning sin in the flesh. This is the incarnation, guys. I mean, it's just perfect timing for this to, to land here in Romans, realizing that that's what we celebrate during December. We're celebrating the fact that God took on flesh. God became incarnate. Almighty God who has existed from all of eternity past in three distinct persons. We're talking about the Trinity here, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One God, three distinct persons who have existed from all of eternity the second person of the Godhead, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, stepped out of eternal glory, emptied Himself. That is to say that He, he didn't cling to His heavenly glory, but He set that aside for a time. And He came to earth, and He was born of a virgin, and He grew up a quiet, humble, submissive life. He lived amongst, He dwelt amongst His people. And He lived that perfect, righteous life that we, His people, could not live. And then he died the death that we all deserved. And so sin was condemned in the flesh on the cross when the Son of God became uh, flesh and died upon the cross for our sin. That is the incarnation. That's what we celebrate ultimately. So often, you know, we, we talk about Jesus in the manger and, you know, all of those kinds of things. And, and that, that's all well and good. But ultimately, the deeper reality is, is that God became man. God took on flesh. And so this is the God-man. And so he is fully human. It's important that we, we recognize that. Sometimes people say 100% God and 100% man, and that's confusing, right? Because then you have 200%. It's, uh, it's better to say he is truly God, truly man, fully God, fully man. And, and that's necessary because if he was not fully God, how could he be perfect? How could he be sinless? He would sin just like us, and He could not save. But He had to be fully human in order to truly represent humanity, and He had to be truly flesh and blood so that there could be a true flesh and blood sacrifice. All of that was necessary in God's uh, marvelous plan of redemption. That is the incarnation. So what we could not do for ourselves, God did for us by sending His Son in the flesh to die for our sins, to die for us, to do what we could not do. And now that's a unique reality in Christianity, all, most other religions that I'm aware of or familiar with would, would say that um, we can do it for ourselves. You can do it. And it might not be easy, but you just have to work real hard at it. You have to, you have to hope that in the end your good deeds outweighed your bad deeds and, and so on and so forth. But Christianity says we could not do it because of the weakness of our flesh. So God did it for us by sending His Son in the likeness of flesh. And Jesus came to save us from the penalty of sin. It's just that, just that clear. People want to try to soften that or, or change that. But the reality is, and the Scriptures are crystal clear, Jesus came to pay our sin debt. He came to take our penalty upon Himself so that the righteous requirement would be fulfilled in us. Jesus, His righteousness is imputed to us. And we who are alive in the Spirit live accordingly. We live in the Spirit. So, that leads us to the second point now. We've talked about freedom in the Spirit. We've been set free from the, from the law. We've been set free from the law of sin and death. And Galatians talks about that. It's for liberty that you've been set free. And do not entangle yourselves again with the yoke of bondage. Do not submit yourself again to the law. Do not return again to your sin. Now we're going to talk about life in the Spirit. Because Jesus said, I came to give life and to give it what? More abundantly. Amen. Abundant life. And that comes through the Spirit. So verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh 
set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So let me, let me simplify this. You're either flesh-minded or spirit-minded. And throughout this chapter, as Paul is talking about the person that is in the flesh, he's talking about someone who's outside of Christ. They're outside of Christ. They're dead in their trespass and sin. They're bound up in this condition. They are bound up in this carnal flesh. And it is what it is. And then you have the person who's been set free. The person who has been set free and they are filled with the Holy Spirit and they are alive in Christ and their mind is set on spiritual things, heavenly things. So you've got the, the person who is living for the temporal here and now. Their mind is set on earthly things, earthly passions, earthly desires, pursuits, ambitions. Then you have the person who is spiritually alive, the spirit-minded person whose mind is set on the things above, who is not just caught up in the here and now, but they're living for the there and then, and they are set on heavenly things. And so Paul makes a distinction between that. And so I, as I started thinking through, what does that look like exactly? What is it to be spirit-minded or flesh-minded? I think that Colossians gives us some good insight into this. So if you have your Bibles, why don't you turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. Spend a few minutes uh, looking at what the Bible says about people in the flesh versus people that are in the Spirit. Try to figure out where, where we fit into this. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 is where we will pick up. Now, I just talked about the fact that we who are in Christ have ascended with Him. We've talked at length about how we have died with Christ. We've risen again with Christ into the newness of life. And Paul says we've ascended with Christ into heavenly places where He is seated at the right hand of the Father and that our lives are hidden with Christ. And that uh, then He says this, Therefore, verse 5, Put to death your members which are on the earth. So this describes the earthly. This describes the fleshly, carnal person. First off, fornication. That's really it's sex outside of marriage. It's sexual immorality, specifically in that sense. And Paul says that that is behavior fitting the old man. If you're a Christian, if you are in Christ, you are striving for sexual purity. Sexual purity. Uncleanness, that would be more in the general sense of all types of sexual immorality. Passion, it's, it's very much kind of the same idea. Evil desire, put to death evil desires. You know, I think about in Romans, we already talked about this, it describes someone as being an inventor of evil. You know, like the evil that's already happening isn't enough. You have to create new ways of being evil. And so evil desires, you know, are... That's someone who is living for, driven by, entertained by evil, evil desires. And covetousness, which is idolatry, the mind that is set on the flesh, the flesh-minded person, they always want more, just one more. It's never enough. Or they want what other people have. Or even worse, they don't want other people who have it to have it. That's the covetous person. And we're told here that that's idolatry. That is worshiping anything and everything but God. Instead of giving glory to the Creator, you are living for, driven by the creation, lesser things, things here on the earth. Those can be good things at times. It could be career. It could be a house. It could be family. It could be hobbies. It could be any number of those things. Or it can be flat-out, heinous, sinful things. But covetousness, idolatry, these are things that are of the flesh. This is the thing that the, the, t the carnal mind is set on. Verse 8, but you know, but now you yourselves are to put off all of these. And then he kind of continues on in verse 8 here. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds. So this describes the old man. This describes the old man. And this may still describe some, some of us in this room here. 
There may be someone in this room who is still very much in this place. This describes you. Controlled by, driven by outbursts of anger. You're a wrathful person. Malicious. Blasphemous. Filthy language. You know, that's something that Christians, we've got to really watch out for. How, what's your speech like? What's your speech like? Is it glorifying to God? Does it bless other people? And, you know, I'm, I'm talking about crude language, crude joking and jesting, but even just gossip and things like that. I've often thought, you know, and I don't always do so well at this, but this is kind of the rule of, of, of thumbs for me. I wouldn't want anything to come out of my mouth that wouldn't absolutely bless somebody if they were eavesdropping. If they were over-listening over and I didn't know it, um, and I was talking about them, I would want them to be absolutely blessed and encouraged by that, right? As opposed to being devastated or crushed or hurt or, or driven to anger. And so, uh, again, you know, having pure speech, edifying, uplifting speech, that, that is um, not the case for the person whose mind is set on the flesh. So all of these things, this is the old man. This is what we've been set free from. We have been set free from this, and now we've been given life in the Spirit. The new man, the spiritually alive man or woman, the mind that is set on the Spirit looks a lot like this. Verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies. This idea of tender mercies, I just kind of learned this. Um, you know, Someone who has the gift of mercy, the spiritual gift, they tend to have a, a broken heart for people. They tend to see that somebody is hurting and they, they hurt for them. Um, and I think some, some of us in this room might right now, you might realize, hey, that's me. You know, you, you tend to have a hurting heart for other people. And I've noticed also that people who have this gift often have the gift of, uh, of helps or they're a very generous person. And so they see a need, they feel the burden for the need, and they have the means to help somebody in that need. But here, tender mercies is being very sensitive to it, the idea of tender. And so you're a merciful person, a tender person, sensitive to other people's hurts and pains and, and feelings, and that describes the person whose mind is set on the Spirit, right? Outside of, of Christ, we were not sensitive to other people's needs or hurts, right? Right? And so in Christ, with the mind set on the Spirit, this is somebody who is uh, others-focused, not just inwardly focused. It goes on to say kindness, humility, meekness. And that is not weakness, it's power under control. That's what Christ was. He was the ultimate example of meekness. What He could have done when they were putting Him on that cross, but He submitted Himself to the Father. Long-suffering bearing with one another, forgiving one another. This describes the person who is walking in the Spirit. Not easily offended, not quick to blow up on people, but you are patient, long-suffering, bearing with other people. And you know what this tells us is that there are people in which we got to bear. we got to bear uh, with. And I mean, I think that's not a shock to any of us in here. But the reality, and maybe we are that person, you know, that's something to consider. And so, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. We have to be marked as people who forgive. Do you live and walk in forgiveness? That is a marker of the person who is spirit-minded. Verse 14, but above all these things, put on love. That's the, the number one thing right there. Love, love, love. You can be charismatic. You can be super gifted. You can be influential. You can be all of these things. You can have all kinds of resources. But if you don't have love, it doesn't mean anything. 1 Corinthians 13 talks about that. So must be people who are marked by love, which is the bond of perfection or maturity or completion. Verse 15, let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you were called in one body. And be thankful. The spirit-minded person is a person who is grateful, a person who is thankful to God for every good thing that He has poured out on them. Verse 16, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom. We are people of the Word. 
We love God's Word. We need God's Word. And we need it to, to dwell in us richly. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. So our desire is to bless each other. Our desire is to serve and to love and to care for each other and to build each other up and to pray for each other and to share the Scriptures with each other. That is the spirit-minded person. In verse 17, And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Everything that we do, in all things, we do it for Jesus, in the name of Jesus. And that's, that's a hard thing to do at work. If you've got a job that you just don't particularly care for, realizing that ultimately what you do, you're doing it for the Lord, in the name of the Lord, as unto the Lord. Would, would Jesus be pleased? You know, or whatever area of life it may be, whatever we're doing, doing it in the name of the Lord Jesus, doing it for His pleasure, for His glory, and again, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So that marks the spirit-minded person. Now, obviously, we all fall short in, in some of these areas, maybe many of these areas, but generally speaking, these are the kinds of things that you're going to be praying for and asking the Lord to bring about in you. When we see Paul praying in the Scriptures, when we see people praying, this is the kind of stuff that their prayers are made of. So often I don't think that our prayers look like that. And I think we would do well to really consider the prayers of the Scriptures and let those be our prayers. So I talked about the list of things that we create for ourselves last week, right? We create our own laws, our own uh, rights that we, we observe. Maybe we aren't under the Old Testament law, but we kind of have a general outline of things that we think we should or shouldn't be doing. And I mentioned that we can't even keep our own standards so often, right? But again, even with those standards that we create, those, those little things that we want to make a, you know, a checklist out of, does it look like this? Does it look like anything in here? Does it look like tender mercies or being thankful or letting God's Word dwell in you richly or admonishing and loving other people and encouraging other people? You know, is it, does it look like that? Um, so often I, th I think we have all kinds of goals and things that we set for ourselves thinking that this is the, the, the thing that we ought to be aiming for, but really this is it. It's spiritual. It's a matter of the heart and of the mind. And this kind of thing works itself out. So often we have outward things that we want to see God restore, and we get real busy trying to work towards those things, but what God really wants to do is work on the inside. So this is the inner man, and this is the life in the Spirit. That's what it looks like. And so we have to figure out, where are we? On what side of this equation are you? Obviously, I would want all of us to be the spirit-minded person, and then, then how are we doing with that? How are we doing as spirit-minded brothers and sisters? We need to be praying always that the Lord would work these things out in us and that we would be this person because there's life in that. There's life in the Spirit and there is death in the flesh. Verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Did you catch that? The carnal mind, the carnal person, is an enemy of God. They're not subject to the law of God. They can't please God. It's impossible. You know, 1 John 3.15, it says this, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. The fleshly person, the carnal person, loves the world. They love the world and they're living for the things of the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, possessions, status, position, power, pleasure, all of those things, that's what they're living for. And John says that God's love is not in that person. God's love is not in them. This person is not subject to the law of God. That is to say, they're not under the control or the jurisdiction of God's law. They are outside of it. They are an enemy of God. God's love is not in them. And they cannot please God. 
They're not subject to God's law, nor indeed can they be. And this is an insightful thing because I think Christians expect ungodly people to be godly sometimes. You know, they, they try to force Christian uh, morals on people who are not subject to God's law, nor they can't be. And I remember in, in Tennessee, I was working as a, a welder, and I was um, in, in the break room. There was a, another guy there. He was a professing Christian, and uh, he had probably offended just about every single person in that, in that place. Uh, he was loud, he was obnoxious, and uh, he was a, a very vocal, professing Christian. And so I'm sitting in the break room. He's in there. There's another guy over there, a young, young kid, just really struggling with life. And he's talking, and he says uh, he takes the Lord's name in vain, right? And so the other guy hears this, and he turns around and goes off on him, just rebukes him. And then he turns to me and says, how dare you not say something to this guy for, for you know, taking the Lord's name in vain? And I just thought, and I said, I think God is a lot more offended with a professing Christian who lacerates everybody with his tongue than some unbeliever doesn't even believe in God and takes God's name in vain. And that's just the reality of it. We can't expect people who are outside of Christ to live as though they are. Um, and we should be praying for folks that are outside of Christ, that God would indeed have mercy on them, and that they would come to Him, and that they would be set free from the flesh, and that they would be born of the Spirit, and that they would grow in this way. But we can expect ourselves and each other to do better, and should. I think if we got as angry with ourselves as we do other people, it would do us a lot of good. If we hated our sin as much as we hated other people's sin, it would do us a lot of good, don't you? Verse 9. Here's the good news. But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. So again, Paul's making this distinction between the, the carnal person and the Spirit-filled person. And again, the indwelling of the Spirit is a very unique and wonderful reality and promise. In John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus says this, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and He will give you another Helper, that He may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. But you know Him, for He dwells with you, and He will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. So again, this is another promise that is unique to Christianity. Every other religion says that you can attain. You just got to work hard at it. You got to white-knuckle your way into heaven. Again, here... God says, you can't, I'll do it for you. And furthermore, I'm going to give you my spirit. And he's going to change you from the inside out. So what we begin to do, these things that we're striving for that I just talked about, it's because that's the desire. God births that desire in us by his Holy Spirit and then gives us the power to do it by his Holy Spirit. And that is the good news of being spiritually adopted. It's not a matter of just working as hard as we can and agonizing and toil toiling to no end with no real hope in sight. No, God did for us what we could not do. He didn't just save us. He filled us with His Spirit, changed us from the inside out, and empowers us to do that which is pleasing to Him. That is one of the glorious blessings of being adopted into God's family and being born of His Spirit and dwelled by the Spirit. And notice here that the Spirit is referred to as the Spirit of Christ. I love that. Again, it's Trinitarian. That is to say that the Holy Spirit is Christ and the Father is the Holy Spirit. They are one. It's hard for us to understand that. They are distinct. God didn't die on the cross. The Holy Spirit didn't pay for my sins. You understand? But at the same time, they are three in one. It is one God. We don't believe in three distinct gods. And so the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God is at times referred to as the Spirit of Christ. And it says that if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you are not His. It's just that simple, guys. Do you have the Spirit of Christ living in you? Are you indwelt by the Holy Spirit? Are you indwelt by the Spirit of Christ? I know that maybe you prayed a prayer at some time. 
or whatever you may have done, but let me be frank with you. Are you a Spirit-filled person? If you are, you're going to look something like Jesus. If you've got the Spirit of Christ in you, you're going to look something like Him. Now, that may vary at different times of my life or, my life or your life, um, and we all have struggles to be sure, but there's going to be something in you that desires to do the will of the Father, something that looks strikingly like Jesus. If we've been spiritually adopted, guess what? There's going to be a family resemblance. All right, well, verse 10, he says, And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So there is this reality, and I've, I've been talking about this for the last couple weeks. There is this flesh, this body, that is indwelt by God's Spirit. Now this flesh is going to die and go into the grave and decompose, but the Spirit will live on. And thus, that is the battle. And one day, I will have a new body that will match the Spirit, and I will be glorified in God's sight, and we will worship Him forever and ever in, in perfect holiness and purity and, and all of that wonderful stuff, right? But here and now, we still have this body of death and the Spirit living in it, and there is this battle that is going on. But... Since we have the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead, as it says there, we will have life in our mortal bodies. We can live righteously in this, in this tent, this, this flesh that we are current, our spirit is housed in currently. Notice he says that we have the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead. That is straight out of Ephesians 1, 19-20. Paul is praying and he's talking about this power, this dynamic, explosive power. That same power that was working, that raised Jesus from the dead, is at work in us. Is that amazing? That's what it takes to bring life. I don't, realize, I don't think we know just how dead we really were. I don't know if we realize that song we were singing today about God doing miracles, a conversion, a person going from death to life is one of the greatest miracles that we will see in this lifetime. And God is in that business. God is in the business of bringing dead people to life. And He does that by the Holy Spirit. That same power that raised Jesus from the dead is raising people to life today and enabling us to live godly lives. So He says here that He will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. We will have power to live godly lives. Even though this flesh is corrupt, it's, it's, it is not of God, and the Spirit of God is in us, and there is this war, even still, that power that raised Jesus from the dead is sufficient to cause us to live godly lives. Amen? It says in 2 Peter that we have been given all things pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who has called us by glory and virtue. All things pertaining to life and godliness is ours by the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, making us sons and daughters of God. So verse 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live. So we are not debtors. We are not bound or captive to the flesh. We don't live according to the flesh, which results in death. I would say that's spiritual death. If you are a carnal person, your mind is set on the things of the flesh, you are outside of Christ, you will certainly die a spiritual, eternal death. The Bible is very clear. It does not mince words about that. But I would also say there's physical death. When you are living contrary to God's good purpose and God's good law, it just does not go well. It doesn't. But if you are in the Spirit living according to God, according to Christ Jesus, there is life. And I would say that's eternal life. It's eternal spiritual life. But I would also say it's physical. If you keep God's commands and you worship Him and love Him, it will generally go well for you in this land. If you're a lawbreaker, bad things tend to happen. If you're a law keeper, if you observe the law, I'm just using this in a very 
temporal kind of um, example here. Now, you know, you'll do well in life generally. If you're a good employee, you work hard, you do what's asked of you, generally you're going to excel at your job. Or vice versa, you're going to end up getting fired, most likely. You see what I'm saying? So when it comes to God in the Spirit, there is life physically and eternally. But conversely, if you are in the flesh, if you have a mind that is set on the flesh, if you are outside of Christ, it does not go well. It's death, ultimately. All right, so now we're going to talk about this adoption that is ours, the sonship that is ours in God. And this is really where I think we start to get to the crux of this message. We're going to talk about the intimacy that is bound up in all of this with the Father as those who have been adopted. Verse 14, For as many of us as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. As many as are led by the Spirit, these are sons of God. That is to say, submitted to and governed by. You have those who are not subject to God's law. They're not under its authority or jurisdiction. Then you have those who are led by the Spirit. They are submitted to and governed by the Spirit. These, Paul says, are the sons of God. These are the children of God, sons and daughters of God. And this is such a wonderful reality again this is another unique thing about christianity all other religions they would just be shocked at this notion of having a loving relationship with god and god being your father in fact this was revolutionary for the jews when jesus started talking about it but john 1 12 says but as many as received him to them he gave the right to become children of god to those who believe in his name 1 John 3, 1 says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. What manner of love is this that God has poured out on us that we should be adopted into His family and be called children of God? Ephesians 5, 1, Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also loved us and has given Himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. And so we are sons and daughters of God. We are children of God. That is such an incredible love that God has poured out on us that we would have that blessed privilege and heritage. And there is responsibility that comes with that. Paul said that as dear children of God, we are to imitate Him. We are to imitate God. We're to look like Him. We're to have that family resemblance. How do we do that? Walking in love, as Christ also loved us and gave Himself for us. Sacrificial love. Sacrificial service. Looks a lot like Jesus. And so that, we are children of God. It's one of the most glorious privileges, and it comes with a responsibility. We're to look like God, act like God as modeled for us in the person of Jesus Christ. Notice that it's not the spirit of bondage to fear. Perfect love casts out fear because that involves torment. But we're not under torment. We're not under fear, are we? We're under God's love. And perfect love, complete and mature love, that which is in Christ, casts out fear. We don't have a relationship of torment and dread with the Father. We've been given a spirit of adoption. God has become our Heavenly Father. It says, through which we cry out, Abba, Father. Maybe you've heard that before. Maybe you've even heard people when praying refer to God as Abba. And the idea is, that is, that is um, I had a, 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 an acquaintance. They went to Israel and they were telling me about it. And they said they were at the swimming pool. And they were watching all the families out there. And the kids would be playing. And one thing he kept hearing over and over was, Abba, Abba. And it kind of clicked. That's, that's what is going on here. These children, that's like saying, Daddy, Daddy. And in a sense, that's what we have. That's the spirit. That is the, the relationship. He is our loving, heavenly Father. I want to be careful. I don't want to get too loosey-goosey with that kind of language. I think sometimes people do. Um, our God is a consuming fire. He is almighty, eternal, holy God. 
but He is our heavenly, loving Father, and He has adopted us. He didn't just pardon our sins. He adopted us and brought us in. He brought us in to be beloved children of God. And that was, Ephesians 1 says that He's predestined us unto that before the foundations of the world that we would be adopted into His family. Think about this story. There was a kid that had been adopted and the other siblings really mocked him, ridiculed him for it. And so they would tease him all the time. This really hurt him, really got to him until one day it really dawned on him and his face lit up and then he said, you know what, it's true. I am adopted. That just means they chose me. They didn't have any choice with you. They got what they got. And so that's the reality of it. God chose us. God chose to set His affection on us. He chose to save us and He chose to invite us into His family and to continue to love us as a Heavenly Father. And now we can come boldly into His presence. We can come boldly before His throne of grace as beloved children. That is our relationship to Him now. That's how we relate to Him. He's our loving Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus made that possible for us. Verse 16. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. So this idea of His Spirit bears witness with our spirit, that that speaks of this internal assurance that one ought to have if you're in the love of God. If you are in the love of God, and He is yours, and you are His, then you ought to kind of know that just in your heart. This can be, um, this can be a little tricky because I, you see some Christians who walk in with the Lord 20, 30, 40 years, and they still don't know if they're saved or not. And that's a, that's a, that's a shame. It ought not be that way. John, 1 John says, I've written these things to you so that you may know that you have eternal life. We have assurance in these things. This is not a guessing game. This is not wishing and hoping. I mean, we know that we know. And one of the ways that we know is that His Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are in His love. I think above that, it's really just standing upon the truth of God's Word. Because how we feel changes, does it not? It changes hourly, sometimes by the minute. And so this is true, and I say yes and amen to this, My spirit bears witness with his spirit. I know that I am in God's love, and you ought to have that too. But that's not what my hope is anchored to. It's anchored to the truth. I know that I know that God sent his son to die for me, and that if I put my trust in him and repent of my sins, believe on him, that I will be saved, born again. And so there is this assurance there, this bearing witness that we are children of God, that he is my father, that he loves me, that I love him. It says in that if we are children, we are heirs, heirs of God. And again, Paul, again, is using this language week after week after week. It's just really occurring to me how he's using language that the Roman recipients would totally understand. He is speaking their language. This was a very common practice, adoption for the purpose of finding an heir. Because oftentimes the, the family, they would have this large inheritance and They would need to hand it on to the next generation. There may not be anyone there to hand it on to. Or what would often happen is the person wasn't competent to receive that inheritance and to carry on the burden of the family responsibility. And so they would adopt. They would find someone who was competent and they would be adopted for the purpose of being an heir. And so, you know, we were orphans. We were outside of Christ. He said, I'm not going to leave you that way. I'm going to send my Holy Spirit. I won't leave you as orphans. We were pardoned. We were forgiven. We were brought into the family of God. Not only that, but we have an inheritance. We have the promises of God. We have the rewards of God that await us in heaven. The blessings of God. He truly took us who were spiritually impoverished, forgave us, brought us in, and has dumped a bounty of blessing upon us as heirs. And then he says this, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. We will certainly share in God's glory. We will be in glory in heaven, and that in and of itself is a, such an awesome thing to consider. But at the same time, there is suffering. 
there is suffering in this life. And just as certainly as Christ suffered, we aren't exempt from it. Some people would tell you otherwise. Some people would say that, that uh, it's all prosperity, there's no suffering, there's none of that. That's simply not true. And I remember I used to, there was a season of my life where I was really going through it. And I was just heartbroken. And I would uh, often comfort myself with the, the scripture in Psalm 53 or Isaiah 53, I'm sorry. He was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And I thought, man, if my Lord was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, uh, why shouldn't I be? What right do I have to be exempt from that? And so it is true. There is glory. There is suffering. But the suffering is temporary. And next week we're going to see in the next verse, Paul says that I don't count the suffering of this, this present age to be counted in any way comparable to the glory that we will share in with God in Christ Jesus. And so we'll stop here. Joe, you want to come up and close us with a song? I just want to pray. I just want to thank God for, uh, for this truth, for this reality of the Holy Spirit and what He has done making us sons and daughters of God. Let me pray for us. Father, we love You. We bless Your holy name. We can't thank You enough, Lord, that You saved us. Lord, You did not leave us in that place of being flesh-minded and dead in our trespass and sin. You didn't do that. God, You pulled us up out of that place and You forgave us and You washed us. You pardoned us, but You didn't leave us there, Father. You called us in to be sons and daughters through the spirit of adoption through which we cry out, Abba, Father, and now You're our loving Heavenly Father and You have poured Your Spirit out on us. You have filled us with Your Spirit. You are changing us from the inside out and empowering us, God, to walk in a way that is pleasing. And now we relate to You as our loving Heavenly Father and there's no greater joy, no greater reality than that. And we look to the day, God, when we will see You face to face and we will fall before You in love and adoration and gratitude and awe and we will worship You and praise You. So here and now, Father, receive our worship. Receive our praise. Thank You, God, that You've done this for us. If there's anyone in this room who doesn't know this, God, I pray that today would be the day that they would set their hearts on You, that they would cry out, God, for forgiveness, that they would turn away from their sins, from their wickedness, and that they would confess Christ, be forgiven, and commit their lives to following you, to loving you, and walking with you. And so we thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen.